morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to see everyone. I, I'll, uh, my name is Eric Kennedy. I'll speak on behalf of, of Dr. Ebenstein and Dr. Wheatley. And also we have a student with us today this for the morning session, Gary Everly. So Gary's joined us as well. Thank you for your time, Gary. Um, before we got too far into this, we just wanted to see good, first of all, just make sure everybody can interact with us. And also we're, we're really curious because um, to see where you all are from. So if you wouldn't mind, just drop into the chat um, where everybody's from. Maybe you can just give us your hometown and state or country. Uh, so, so somebody from Maryland, be more specific because I'm from Westminster, Maryland. I think I saw Walnut Creek, California. I went to Northgate High School in Walnut Creek. I grew up in California. Baltimore, Bethesda. Oh. So lots of people from our nearby area, actually quite a bit of from the, the, the areas that, that Bucknell has a pretty heavy draw from. Um, so it's good to see everybody, but it's good to see some people from across the country as well. And we just hope everybody's doing well um, amidst everything that's going on. Thank you for joining us this morning uh, to spend some time with us. Um, you can, if you haven't dropped that in, feel free, to, we'll, we'll keep looking because we're just curious to know where everybody's from. A real quick um, overview of what's going on today. You received an email from us, uh, just as a reminder, we, we have a, what we planned to do is a bit different than what the other sessions were. So we have a, a kind of a, a double session today uh, with us at 11, uh, speaking more specifically to an introduction to the field of biomedical engineering. Uh, we'll overview uh, then the transition to biomechanics is a subset of biomedical engineering, but we'll give an overview of the entire field of biomedical engineering first. Um, with After biomechanics, we'll talk a little bit about prosthetics, and I know uh, you all um, were encouraged to build a finger model um, using uh, some uh, commonly available materials, and hopefully you're able to do that. And then we'll show you a prosthetic, Gary, uh, our senior, uh, that's joined us. We'll be able to show you a prosthetic that we actually develop here at Bucknell um, and, uh, and, uh, and actually deploy uh, with some uh, local children uh, that might need one. Donna's, Dr. Ebenstein's got one in her hand there. Um, when we break for our session at 1, 1 p.m., we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the specifics of biomechanics and, and uh, the motion capture system, a motion capture system that we have here on campus and that we use and is a really interesting tool. And I think actually you generally has a lot of appeal with our students when they get a chance to use it uh, in, in their classes. Uh, ben Wheatley from Mechanical Engineering is gonna overview uh, uh, some demos that we already pre-recorded um, and let you see the data that comes out of them. And we'll talk about some of the real world applications of uh, 3D motion capture. And then we'll have a session at the end just to any kind of take home message and, and wrap up. And for those that wanna stick around, and I'll just note too with the time, uh, the two time spans here, I think uh, all of us are, are able to kind of hang out if there are some questions that people have after the morning session, but before the afternoon session, we'd be happy to hang out and answer some questions too at that time, but we'll, we'll take questions after each session. Um, so without any further ado, uh, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Ebenstein, and then uh, we'll get through some introductions and then dive into some material. So just a reminder, feel free to use that chat to type in questions that we can address later on. Um, whenever they appear to you, you don't have to wait till the end to type in questions and we'll, we'll go back through them at the end. Uh, and, so I'm Professor Shibbentine, I teach in biomedical engineering here at Bucknell and I've taught here for 14 years. And my research area is in biomaterials and nanomechanics. So I study mechanical properties of materials on really small length scales. I've just always been fascinated by nature and natural materials and like the body as a machine and the how cool nature is. So anything where I can study something natural, I'm pretty excited about. So what I use is a tool called nano indenters and micro indenters, which means I take a really small tip and press it into a sample, call it controlled poking, so that we can measure local material properties in a sample. So we can figure out what's the stiffness in one region of a really small sample or in a different region. So as an example, you can see at the top on the right side there, there's animal whiskers. So Gary, who's here to talk today about Enable, also did research with me on cat whiskers. And we're interested in studying whiskers because 
robots. Uh, people are designing bio-inspired robots to do kind of search and rescue, and they are modeling it off rats who use their whiskers for sensing. So we're mostly focusing on control. We're interested in what, how would you design the whisker to optimally transmit information about the environment. So we want to study animal whiskers, and they're actually very small, so they're 300, 500 microns in diameter. And they're also multi-material, so we found that we have two layers, an outer cortex and an inner medulla. So with nano indentation, we can actually indent in those different regions after we section the samples and measure the mechanical properties of each of those subregions, even in these very small samples. So that's really cool. And then another example that uses micro indentation is we did an analysis of denture teeth. So as you know, your teeth are not big flat samples that you could put in a big testing machine and break, but they are important to understand the mechanical properties of them because they're important for chewing and things like that. So we developed a method to use micro indentation to map the mechanical properties of teeth and see if certain tooth types denture teeth, replacement teeth, are harder or more durable than others. I have to reclaim control of the screen there. Um, so uh, I will switch over. Uh, uh, my name is Eric Kennedy. I'm a faculty member in biomedical engineering along with Dr. Ebenstein. Um, I'll just briefly, I have two slides to briefly introduce kind of my, my research. Um, my background's really in mechanical engineering and then I transitioned later uh, to biomedical engineering, um, and one of the one of the areas that I, I look at is, uh, is I have uh, some involvement in orthopedic biomechanics, and so we work with some physicians at Geisinger Medical Center, which is just down the road from us, and they came with an interesting question uh, after a patient who has ex uh, experienced trauma to their right lower limb. Uh, they were interested in evaluating them to uh, determine whether it was acceptable for them to return to drive. Uh, if anybody wants to drop in the chat why you think it's very specifically oriented toward the right lower limb, I'd love to uh, I'd love to hear it. Um, but uh, so we were interested in developing a machine that could simulate driving and then uh, evaluate whether or not they were uh, able to uh, re resume driving. Uh, let's see, I, I closed the chat window, but Todd can tell me, did anybody drop in there breaking? Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> Yep, a, a couple of people just did saying that uh, you use your right leg to push the pedal, both the gas and the brake. Yeah, it's uh, apparently nobody knows how to drive a standard transmission anymore. Um, but uh, but anyway, so uh, our, when they came to me with a specific question about the right leg, I thought it was really interesting. But then we realized uh, as I talked to them more, I understood what they were saying. Um, and, uh, and so we developed a, a simulator that we could actually assess how much force they could put on the pedal. So that graph that you see, the red and the blue lines represent two different people that were stomping on the brake pedal as hard as they could. And then you can use that as an assessment mechanism to determine whether or not it's safe for them to resume driving. The other thing that I do, and the, frankly, the thing I spend more of my time and in, in find uh, even more personal engagement in is uh, some uh, playground related safety. So I do a lot of child injury biomechanics and I look specifically at playgrounds these days um, and uh, the standards that surround child injury prevention on, stand on playgrounds. And uh, it might sound like a really unique niche, which it is actually is a really unique niche. Um, it's a very small field. Um, but the reason I'm mostly interested in it is because there's, a, there's been very antiquated standards from playground safety. And if you look at where children are injured, playgrounds are the leading location of injury for children less than 10 years old in any type of recreational activity. So that leads bicycles, that leads any kind of sports. Um, it, playgrounds are the leading site of injury. And so we look at things like, uh, do these mats that are under swings uh, actually help prevent injury or do they lead to injury, do they lead to higher injury risk? And so I do some field testing and things related to that to determine if our playgrounds are safety. So safer, sorry. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Wheatley, I believe. Hi everyone, my name is Ben Wheatley. I'm an assistant professor in mechanical engineering here at Bucknell. I've been here for three years now and uh, my expertise is in soft tissue mechanics. And so our group, we are really focused on how um, musculoskeletal tissues such as skeletal muscle or tendons or ligaments, how they function in the body from a mechanical perspective. Um, I'm going to talk more about that later on, but uh, we use a bunch of different traditional mechanical engineering techniques such as material testing, which is shown in the top there, um, which is actually a muscle sample being stretched in two different directions at once. And so we'll do uh, materials testing on, on these types of soft musculoskeletal tissues and then create associated 
uh, computer models to better understand how they function in the human body. So for example, we have models um, of the knee shown in the top center there um, of muscle in the leg, a muscle in the leg known as the tibialis anterior shown in the bottom there. Um, and then we also use musculoskeletal modeling, which we're gonna highlight at the end to better understand how muscles contribute to movement. So um, really, I, I, I'm really interested in how these, mechanic, how these tissues function mechanically and how they contribute to movement and then how people who have uh, pain as a result of some injury or some disease, um, how, how that affects the mechanics of the tissue. Hi, I'm Gary. Um, I'm going into my senior year at Bucknell as a biomedical engineering and English double major. So I'm just going to give a more personal introduction. So on Bucknell, um, I'm involved very heavily in Enable. I'm the president of Enable, which is the 3D printing prosthetics organization that you'll hear about a lot later. All right, so now we want to dive into our kind of disciplinary lecture. So I want to talk a little bit about what is biomedical engineering. And before I tell you how we define it, I want to know what do you think of as when you hear biomedical engineering? So use the chat window and type in a response to a question such as the one shown below. Like, what do you think of when you hear biomedical engineering or biomedical engineer? What do you think biomedical engineers do or study? So any ideas you have, just type them into the chat window. There's no wrong answers here. I see human body, that's a good start, especially with the picture on the slide, so good at taking cues. How engineering can improve medicine, medicine, designing stuff to help the body, medical devices, prosthetics, assist and treat humans, engineering materials and devices to help improve human health, engineering to help living things, improving the body, helping the body, using technology and new innovations in medicine, engineering and durable and effective products to help the body of living things, prosthetics, any other areas besides prosthetics that you can think of that biomedical engineers might contribute to. See some disciplines here, so chemistry and biology. We got implants, good. Designing devices that relate to the body. Medicine delivery, so you have drug delivery or treatments. 3D printing cells and tissues, stents. Combining anatomy of the body. Ventilators, organs, cell circuits, nice. Surgery machines working with mirrors. All right, so this is a really good broad spectrum. Sorry, I was muted during all that. So hopefully you looked through that and you saw that we had all sorts of different things from organs to devices to uh, cell circuits, which was really cool, applying things like physiology and things that the study of engineering. So lots of great ideas here. And you can see, we also agree that biomedical engineering is a really broad field. So it can apply to things like tissue engineering, surgical equipment, medical imaging, prosthetics, cardiovascular devices, cancer treatments, tissue engineering, where you grow cells and tissues. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? This is by no means all inclusive. So biomedical engineering is an extremely broad field, as you can tell even from your knowledge of it. So one thing we think about when we're trying to define biomedical engineering is given how broad it is, how do we define it? So if we think about the more traditional engineering disciplines like mechanical engineering, electrical, chemical, for those we kind of have a framework to think about it. We think that mechanical engineers apply the principles of mechanics to better society. Electrical engineers apply the principles of electricity to better society. And chemical engineers apply the principles of chemistry to better society. Right? So we can think about applying different disciplines. So then what do we think of for biomedical engineers? If we make an analogy to that, we might think that biomedical engineers apply the principles of biology to better society. But that's not actually the way we think of ourselves. Because we're not really defined by the tools we use, but rather by the problems that we work on. Who's scribbling on my slides? Uh, so we don't really think about it as having unique tools so much as we're defined by our application. So we're interested in studying, as you, some of you pointed out in the group chat, right? We apply engineering and science disciplines to improve healthcare, to improve devices, to improve the world. Another way we can think about defining biomedical engineering is looking at what our national organization, the Biomedical Engineering Society, how does it define biomedical engineering? 
and they say that a biomedical engineer uses traditional engineering expertise to analyze and solve problems in biology and medicine. So we're applying traditional engineering tools to solve problems in biology and medicine. So this ties back to the idea that we're defined not by the tools we use. We use all engineering tools and even science tools to solve these problems, but really by what we're solving and it's clinical problems that we're focused on. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, so another way to think about it. So these, I know these are all kind of complementary ways, but various ways that I've heard biomedical engineering described is that we're the pirates or the jack of all trades of engineering. So we use the tools, we take whatever tools we need from other disciplines and we apply them to clinical problems. And these disciplines can be quite uh, varied, right? They can be physiology, biology, chemistry, physics, math, more of the sciences, and also all the different engineering disciplines. So we draw from lots of different areas in order to solve these clinical problems because they're multifaceted problems. They don't require just a simple, single discipline in order to solve them. So we're gonna go through a couple examples. We'll start with the electrocardiogram or the EKG. Hopefully um, you've seen these, someone hooked up to it either because you've had to visit someone in the hospital or you've watched a TV show like Grey's Anatomy that takes place in a the hospital. They're very common medical device in every hospital room essentially where you're gonna have a surgery or something. This one's a little old. You can see it's still plotting on plotter paper instead of on a computer monitor. But basically an EKG is a medical device that's used for diagnosis of heart conditions and monitoring of heart function. So that signal that you see up there, we say that's kind of like the, the trace that we see. And a doctor can look at that and see irregularities in it if there's a problem with the heart. So instead of having to actually listen with a stethoscope or something, they can use this visualization of the electrical signals of the heart to say, okay, somebody's got a problem. So my question for you is, have you ever considered what are all the engineering disciplines that go into creating this trace, right? To make this one little thing appear on the screen. How many different disciplines contributed to a device that would allow you to do that? And the answer is quite a few. So we have pumping of the heart is kind of the first step we need to understand, right? Our heart has sequential pumping that requires mechanical engineering and physiology to understand, but that's all controlled by electrical potentials in the heart. So our cardiac tissue, generates electrical potentials that move sequentially through the heart and that's what causes that mechanical contraction. Then those electrical signals result in body surface potentials. So if you put electrodes on your body, you can actually sense those surface electrodes and monitor these electrical signals that are changing over the course of the heart pumping. So to detect the surface potentials, we need to understand physics and electrical engineering, but then to actually design the electrodes, we need chemical engineering, material science as well to complement that in order to make a thing that will trans translate that electrical signal into from the body into a signal that we can see on a computer screen. Once we get that signal, it's actually a really low amplitude signal that you're trying to sense, right? This is like a little electrical signal from your heart that's we're getting a little sense of it on the surface. So we need to amplify that signal. We need to clean it up so that it's a nice clean trace for a doctor to look at. That's gonna require more electrical engineering. And then finally, we wanna display that on a user interface, right? That a doctor can interact with or a nurse. And so for that, we need computer science and engineering. So lots of different disciplines play a role here. And so we have a poll question for you, which is which aspect of the EKG do you think would be most interesting for you to contribute to? If you got to be part of a team working on this, which area do you think would be most interesting? So we're going to have Todd put out a poll now, so go ahead and put in some answers to that. What do you think would be most interesting to contribute to? We'll share the results back here in just a moment. Some people are still voting. Give you some time to answer. It's interesting to see them come in as, as we're watching. So those of you filling it out, you don't get the real time results until they're, they're, they're displayed. But what we get a chance to see is kind of, you know, a lot of you have joined this session and have different, different bents on why you're interested in biomedical engineering. And so one of the things that we're, we, we get to see here is what, what aspects of biomedical engineering interest you the most. So this is quite interesting to watch come in. I think we'll end the poll. I think most of you have, have voted. So if you, if you want to get your vote in, we'll, we'll give it like five more seconds here so we don't leave someone out. Okay.
And I think we should have just shared the results. So you should be able to see the, yep. see the results there. Hopefully you can see that uh, we have a pretty good spread here. About 40% were interested in the cardiac muscle and pumping of the heart with a more mechanical engineering and physiology. Second was 29% with sensing biosignals through the skin interface. So thinking about that electrode interface and how we sense things. And then 18% for bioelectric signals, which is more the electrical engineering and physiology side and 10%, 11% for data processing and display. So electric and computer engineering. So if we advance to the next slide, you can see, oh, sorry, go back to the, just where it says biomedical engineers in the center. So my thought was, yeah, right after, so the cool thing about being a biomedical engineer is that you get to know a little bit about all this stuff, but you might be a specialist in one of those areas. So you can contribute to a project like this by being the expert on the biomechanics or being the expert on the bioelectrical stuff or on the chemical engineering material side, or you can kind of be the manager at the center who knows how to communicate with all those different types of engineers because of your training and can then know who to tap into for the different areas of the project. So I think one of the cool things about the biomedical engineer as we apply tools of many different disciplines is you get enough training to know all the language of all these different engineering and science disciplines to know when you need an expert in that area to really contribute to a project. So you might choose one area of expertise like biomechanics or bioelectrical, but then you tap into other people who are expertise in other areas. And together you can create these great medical devices that impact people. All right, so now we'll go to our second example, which is prosthetics. And I have here shown both hand prosthetics and leg prosthetics, so upper and lower extremity prosthetics. Uh, we'll talk mostly about the, the hands today because of Gary's work with Enable that we want to highlight. But we also, you know, I'd show you that there's many other body parts that we have prosthetics for. And the main point here is if you look, there's quite a variety of different designs and different ways we create prosthetics. Um, and they vary from being very basic and almost more aesthetic to being mechanically actuated to being electromechanical systems, almost robotic devices. So there's a broad spectrum of ways that we treat these issues of amputations or birth defects that mean that you don't have the limbs that, uh, you know, we're used to working with in our daily lives. So the first type of prosthetic I want to show you is just a body powered prosthetic, which is, I mean, I guess the most basic is just an aesthetic one, one that just looks like a hand so that people don't notice that you don't have a, a hand. But the one we're going to look at here is the body powered prosthetic. So we're going to watch a little video that shows how it works. And while we watch the video, I just want you to think about and type into the chat window what types of engineering or science disciplines do you think contributed to the development of this device? What types of expertise would you need to bring into the design of this? Not hearing any sound, might be muted. But the main thing to watch, even if we don't have sound, is you just want to see. If I there spread my shoulders out, same thing. If I stop and lock the elbow, those same motions will open the hook, which closes on the force of some rubber bands. It's confining and clunky, really not much more than a hook on a stick. It's better than nothing sometimes, but not always. So main idea there is you basically shrug your shoulders to control this thing, it's very basic. Um, as far as mechanical actuation, you shrug your shoulders up and it, the hook opens and you relax and the hook closes and that's the way it functions. So type into the, the chat window here, what kind of disciplines do you think would contribute to the design of this? So I see physics, mechanical engineering, lots of mechanical engineering, good. And mechanical is going to be the physiology, good, because we have to interact with tissue, with the, with the stump. We need to make sure it's comfortable. Anatomy, good. We need to know how to design it so it's like a hand. For this definitely electrical engineering actually doesn't go into this one very much because it's all mechanical, but we that will come into play later. But I'd say the other thing that's not in here, chemical, and there you go, somebody added chemical engineering materials, right? So that's the other piece, right? We need to design our materials so that they're lightweight, right? You don't want a really heavy prosthetic and it needs to be comfortable and not irritate the skin. There's also biocompatibility issues, which goes back to physiology. So basically mechanics, materials, physiology, biology, and some physics are kind of going to go into this in anatomy. Now we'll move on to the next one, which is the DECA arm. This is one of the most advanced arms now that was funded by, the, by DARPA, which is a funding agency for the military for people who were injured in the war. Yep. 
shoot. Hold on. This it one just when I try and play it. There we go. Farmers insurance, we've seen almost everything. What disciplines contribute to this and how it works? Up until now, most people have visualized prosthetic arms with an immobile hand or a metal hook, but that's all about to change. I'm Sam Sheffer, and this is 90 Seconds on the Verge. The U.S. Food and Drug Association has approved the DECA arm system, a mind control prosthetic that can do multiple simultaneous movements. A number of scientists and engineers from around the world are working on similar limbs, but this is the first one with FDA approval. The DECA arm system is similar in size and weight to an actual human arm. It's capable of detailed tasks like using zippers, brushing teeth, and even handling fragile foods like grapes and eggs. The company has nicknamed it Luke after the character from Star Wars. Notice the similarities? The project is funded by DARPA, but developed by DECA, a company founded by Segway inventor Dean Kamen. Here's how it works. The DECA arm system is controlled by EMG electrodes placed on the remaining portion of the human arm. A computer processor translates muscle contractions into one of 10 specific movements. The system also uses a combination of switches and both movement and force sensors for control, some of which was showcased in a 60 Minutes report from 2009. This is Fred Downs, who was the Veterans Affairs official in charge of prosthetics. First time in 40 years, my, my left hand did this. With FDA approval, DECA can now bring the arm to market. With that said, there's currently no price and won't be until the company finds a commercial partner to mass produce. For more on the DECA arm system, check out The Verge. Coming up, DARPA announces a collaboration all right, so this is a much more complex device. It has a lot more degrees of freedom. If we think about the ways we can move our fingers and our arms, it can actually mimic almost every type of motion that we can make. And it does that because it has a lot of motors and a lot of other systems in there. So yeah, I see some people already typing stuff into the chat room, right? So this has mechanical, chemical, electrical engineer, right? This requires a lot more disciplines to contribute because we've added that electrical component and the controls and everything else you need in order to be able to control all those different degrees of freedom. So the more complex the device gets, the more likely it's going to be a multidisciplinary team working on it in order to solve that problem. And again, the biomedical engineer has the expertise to sit at the center of this team and communicate across all those different disciplines. So just a quick thing here, when they talked about controlling, like making it a brain controlled device, what they're talking about is either controlling with the EMG, uh, which is your signals that your muscles make when they contract, electrical signals, as just shown on the left. Um, so that would be one way to control a prosthetic so that when the person thinks about clenching their fist, all the signals get sent from their brain to the muscles. And even if the muscles aren't all the way down at the fingers now, those muscles that control the fingers go up into the upper arm. So you can find the right muscle group and look at those electrical signals to see what they're thinking about controlling. But then the video on the right uh, shows that where they want prosthetics to go, which is basically a direct implant into your brain, into the region that controls the motor movement of your hand. So when you think about moving your hand, it takes that electrical signal from your brain and controls the prosthetic hand. And this is just an example of a monkey who has an implant in and they're using it to control that robot so they get their banana. So still an experiment, you know, research phase, but this is where they want prosthetics to go, is tapping directly into the brain rather than needing the muscles. All right, so now is the time to get out your finger model if you have one. So if you had a chance to make this before the meeting, pull out your finger model, because what we're gonna do now is think about finger motion. So the ultimate purpose, whether you're controlling with the EMG or the brain signal or with a mechanical uh, device is that we want to move the fingers, right? Our goal is to move a finger by either shrugging our shoulders, by using the EMG signals. So to think about finger movements, we need to introduce some clinical terminology. So one of the things biomedical engineers need to do, as I've said, is communicate across disciplines. So one of those things is knowing proper anatomical terms to describe things so that when you're talking to a clinician, you're all on the same page. So there's two different kind of main finger motions we're going to talk about today. One is flexion and extension. So that's just moving your finger up and down, basically, as shown here. And the other two are abduction, called abduction, and adduction, which we describe adduction, because they sound so similar. And the way that we think about remembering abduction is spreading. And with, uh, Professor Wheatley likes to talk about it as if you're being abducted by aliens, you're being separated from people, so that's, that's the spreading. And adduction is you're adding your fingers to the mass at the center. So that's adduction, adduction is bringing your fingers together. And the final motion here is circumduction, where you take a finger and make a whole circular motion. So I want you to play with your finger model if you have it. 
or on the next slide, we're gonna have some videos of my kids playing with their finger models that we made. And then think about which finger motions can this finger model recreate well, flexion extension or abduction, adduction. So just take a minute to play with your model or watch the videos here that Dr. Kennedy will turn on. You can turn them both on at the same time. And one thing is that's my daughter, Clara. She just finished sixth grade and my son, Thomas, who just finished third grade. And uh, they built these models with me a couple weeks ago. And notice even theirs don't behave exactly the same way. So yours might be a little different depending on how close together you put your pieces of wood or cardboard and things like that where you attached your, your straws. So they all work a little bit differently, but I think you'll be able to answer this Zoom poll as it comes up, which is which finger motions does this finger model recreate? Results are in quickly, I think. So it's looking like uh, looking like flexion is winning, right? So um, anyway, but yeah. So uh, I don't know if let's see. I guess I can end the poll. Yeah. So there you go. But um, but it looks like you know everybody more or less answered that uh, flexion extension, which is our ability to just uh, move our finger like this, is is clearly what that, that model represents. Um, and let's see if I can get to the next, there we go. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so our, uh, I'm just gonna talk for a couple of minutes and then introduce, uh, introduce Gary to show you the enable uh, arm and talk about that, that pro project that happens on campus. Um, so if, if you had um, your, your hand, you'd notice that there, there's some limited motion, you can't, AB duct, you can't AD duct, but you can, uh, yet even with this relatively simple motion, which I guess I'll do like this, you can grasp things, right? So you can actually pick up and hold on to something like a water bottle. So there's a lot of things that even with a relatively simple model that you can enable someone to do, no pun intended, sorry, Gary, um, but, uh, but you can enable lots of uh, different activities just by providing a very basic uh, flexion extension motion on the hand um, and then we can, of course, do even more complex activities if we are able to add in abduction, adduction, and circumduction. So, um, so anyway, so you saw you built the the uh, finger model, and one of the things that we wanted to talk about is, uh, you know, while you built this and were able to see the motion that uh, that it enabled, um, we are we're, biomedical engineers are folks that take and apply engineering principles to the human body in an effort to understand how it works, right? And so one of the things, if you want to build an effective prosthetic hand, you need to be able to at least actually understand the biology and the physiology and the anatomy that goes into actually making our hands work. And so, uh, so just a couple um, uh, schematics here to show. Uh, if you look in, inside our own hands, what you'll see is there's actually a flexor tendon that, that runs along essentially the same pathway as that string in your finger model. And, uh, and so when the muscle pulls on that flexor tendon, and the muscles, of course, only contract, so muscles contract, they pull on that tendon, and just like you pull on that string, and that's what causes the finger uh, to flex closed. Um, what's not shown in this model, and we represent it by, uh, by some rubber bands, but, uh, but then there's some extensors that actually are used to then cause the hand to, to flex um, or to extend open again. Um, so, okay, a couple other uh, pictures here. So if we wanted to add additional um, capabilities to our model, we would have to add in additional uh, tendons and in, in, uh, sometimes they're called hoods or sheaths uh, that would actually enable our hand to move in alternate ways. We'd have to add some complexity to our finger model to enable more complex motions. Um, wanted to talk, uh, you know, if you took uh, I teach a class in sophomore level biomechanics where we take, essentially it's a, it's a mechanical engineering themed course that looks at uh, how do we analyze structures and how do you look at the forces and, uh, and, and, and moments which are essentially uh, twisting forces uh, to actually enable different types of motion um, and how do you calculate those loads. 
And so uh, you'll see if you if you took that course, the figure on the left would show maybe how we would approximate the hand um, and show the the different uh, 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 portions of the of the finger. Um, and then you can actually see uh, a black line here where it says T out. Uh, I don't have my pointer on. I guess I could turn my pointer on. Um, where it says T out here, this would actually be the tension provided by the muscle to actually, as the muscle pulls through here and is attached all the way to this digit, how much force does the muscle need to generate in order to cause that hand to grasp uh, closed? Um, and so there are more elaborate models that could be done. And sometimes the computations required to do this get relatively complex. And so one of the things I wanted to point out is that we'll also, once you know how to do this basic analysis, then you can move over and do a much more complex uh, uh, analysis, more computationally complex, um, and actually do computer modeling to actually simulate those different types of movement and the effects of each of the different muscles. So uh, just some engineering principles uh, that we wanted to tie into your relatively simple model. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Gary to talk a little bit about this model that we've actually, we produce here on, our students produce here on campus. Yeah, so I want to introduce you to a club at Bucknell that works extensively with prosthetics. Um, it's called Enable, and it's dedicated to the 3D printing and fabrication of prosthetic arms for children, like the one that Dr. E was just holding up. So usually prosthetics are very expensive and cost literally thousands of dollars. And because children grow quickly, they often will outgrow any expensive prosthetics that they're able to buy. So through Enable, Bucknell works with, directly with local children and their families to provide prosthetics that will help uh, children regain function in their limbs and also help fight any feelings of isolation that might come from the loss of a limb at a much lower price point than any commercial prosthetic. So now I'm just going to take you through the steps that Enable would follow when developing a prosthetic arm for a child. So first of all, just like in any other engineering project, we'll have to connect with our clients, which in this case is the family of children who need prosthetics. There are two types of upper limb prosthetics. First, as the name implies, is the wrist power prosthetic, which is controlled through the bending of the wrist. The second is elbow powered and would be therefore powered by the bending of the elbow. So, the elbow power prosthetic would be used when the child has a forearm, but not enough rotation in their wrist in order to power a wrist powered prosthetic. So after we've determined what prosthetic model best fits the needs of the client, and you can see Dr. E is holding an elbow power prosthetic now, um, we'll work directly with the child in order to determine what colors they want the prosthetic to be. So one of the challenges with prosthetics is that they can be bulky or that they don't look natural enough. And if the child isn't comfortable with the prosthetic, they might not want to use it as often in their everyday life. So allowing the child to customize the prosthetic and like choose fun like um, color schemes, like maybe Iron Man, like the slideshows or Spider-Man, we can ensure that they can feel comfortable and happy with their prosthetic. So after that, we just take measurements from the uh, kid to make sure that we can build a personalized prosthetic that fits them. So after connecting with the family, the next step in prosthetic donation is the modeling of the prosthetic. So Enable at Bucknell uses several different um, computer softwares to help us 3D print and build arms. So first, the prosthetic designs parts are designed in a computer-aided design software like SolidWorks. And then we actually use um, an animation software called Blender to ensure that the prosthetic model fits the kid that we're building it for. And then finally, we just use a 3D printing software to prepare the 3D print. So after that, we just go through with the 3D printing process. So all Enable prosthetics are primarily 3D printed, which has the advantage of being much cheaper than building with like, for, set, for example, metal. So this allows us to quickly donate prosthetics to family and families to at no extra cost to them. 3D printing itself is an additive process, which just means that the plastic that we're printing with is heated to a really high temperature, which makes it form almost a liquid. And then this hot liquid is extruded from the model and layers of plastic are built on top of each other to build these parts. So through this process, we can create these prosthetic parts very quickly. 
So after all the parts are 3D printed, we move on to fabrication, which is also just the building of the prosthetic hand. So looking at the video on the right, I want to bring up the concept of thermoplastics, which are just plastics that can be placed in high temperature environments. And when they do that, they kind of lose their form and they get softer. And that means that we can um, change their form. So for Enable, we use thermoplastics for some parts so that we can form from hard plastic shapes, the shape of a more curved and natural um, contour that would best fit the kid's like natural contour of their arm. So that's just looking at the thermoforming video, you can see that a hard plastic part is going to be placed in hot water for about 30 seconds, which softens it and allows it to be um, formed around the curved part, changing its shape. So after thermoforming, we assemble the rest of the hand. And even though most of the parts are 3D printed, we do still need a few extra parts like the rubber bands and fishing line. Compared to the um, finger model that you created, the fishing line acts as the tensor and the rubber bands act as the extender. So after the hand is finished, we donate it. So these are the pictures of a hand that we donated um, previously in this year to a girl in Washington state. And then you can see how the bending of the wrist causes the fingers to open or close. So personally, I just like love being able to use what I learned in my biomedical engineering classes to actually build a device for a child that will help them gain um, function in their upper limbs, including being able to like ride a bike, throw a ball, hold a water bottle, things like that. So here's just the final overview of the hands that we donated um, previously this year from modeling to our finished product. So I just wanted to end the enable portion with the idea that prosthetic uh, donation and especially the, pro the prosthetics that we donate are driven by an understanding of biomechanics. And participating in enable gives you the um, ability to kind of see the fruits of your efforts as an engineer and bring all these concepts of mechanical engineering together to benefit society. And in this case, really make uh, kids happy. Oh, I'm not advancing. Right, there we go. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump in now and just uh, bring us to the home stretch of this, uh, our, our morning session. But first, I just wanted to thank Gary again for your time uh, to share what, what our students are doing here at Bucknell. I think this is, it's a really amazing project to watch the, uh, the number of students that are uh, involved in it and to see how dedicated they are to something that they do, they do outside of class that's actually using the skills that they learn inside our class. Um, and it's an entirely student run organization and uh, it's just really neat. So hopefully uh, that might resonate with some of you who are thinking about BME and what you might do with a degree. And uh, Gary's gonna stick around, I think, with us for a few minutes after this. So if anybody has any questions they wanna talk to a student, I'll just note that she won't be in the afternoon session. So, um, so please do stick around and drop questions. You can unmute yourself and talk or you can just drop some questions in the chat now if you want to have a student perspective on biomedical engineering. I'm just gonna take a, just a real quick overview of, of just some things so you can visualize as we wrap up what a biomedical engineering curriculum and, and a, a experience looks like to go through and become a BME. Um, here at Bucknell, I'm just gonna briefly mention we have about 79 students. BME departments tend to be among the smaller size departments at many institutions. Um, ours is 79 students. Um, more than half of which are female students. So this is a major uh, with incredible diversity. Um, and, uh, and so we really have, a, we have an outstanding student body uh, of really highly dedicated students that are all interested in performing or learning how to, how to better mankind through uh, applications of engineering. Uh, Dr. Ebenstein essentially already talked about this and nobody wants to hear about curriculum right now, but I'm just gonna mention that uh, what you see within our BME curriculum is a, a core in, in mechanics, which would be like mechanical engineering, instrumentation, such as in electrical engineering, biotransport, which would mimic uh, chemical engineering. And then we have a design thread throughout that actually talks about design skills because we're engineers and we develop product. Um, and so there's, a, there's significant threads and lots of different themes that are related to all the different engineering disciplines within our curriculum. Um, 
unfortunately, you weren't able to visit this building in person, but we, uh, we learn in a new building on Bucknell's campus called Academic East, and we'll feature one of the spaces in Academic East later this afternoon. Uh, uh, just a couple pictures that I'll quickly show that just talk about kind of the hands-on nature, I think, of engineering as a discipline. And, um, and frankly, I'll just note that uh, although we can, uh, we can deliver some content virtually and online, engineering is a very hands-on and intensive uh, uh, curriculum uh, that, that, is, uh, that we really are looking forward to our return to classes in person uh, this fall semester where our students do uh, lots of different hands-on projects and lots of group work. Uh, and that's, a, that's typical of all the engineering disciplines at Bucknell. Um, so a couple of our first year students doing a heart dissection to actually understand the mechanics of how a heart works, et cetera. So some different things for you to see. Um, the breadth of research, and because I, we wanted to include a slide like this, just to note um, that we've talked about biomedical engineering and prosthetics, which it, when, when we looked at the chat earlier in the beginning of the session, and we asked people what you thought of biomedical engineering, uh, you know, a lot of hits come up with prosthetics and prosthetic design. And when we ask our students what brought them here, what brought them interest what brought them to the field of biomedical engineering, prosthetic design is one of the leading things uh, that people mention. But the breadth of biomedical engineering um, is rather broad. Even among the six faculty and the uh, several faculty that are in other engineering disciplines at Bucknell that do uh, biomedically related research, we have quite a bit of breadth. But the field is actually far more broad than just prosthetics. And we hope to show you a little bit more of that later this afternoon. Um, just so you know, our students go in a variety of different directions. About half of the students go into medical device design. Um, it's not uncommon for a student to come into biomedical engineering with an interest in pursuing uh, medical school or going to PA school to become a physician's assistant, dental school, et cetera. And then we, of course, like other, many other engineering disciplines, our students find opportunities in other areas that, they, that, that are not directly engineering related, but that use their engineering expertise. So patent law, for example, is a big thing for engineers to go into or finance because that company invests in medical device technology. So our students go in a lot of different directions. They also go to uh, graduate school. And so if you're considering engineering, I'm just gonna note that the majority of undergraduate degreed engineers go on to seek advanced degrees. Um, about two thirds of our students seek advanced degrees within the first five years of graduation. Um, and that's something that we, uh, that is pretty common for all engineering disciplines. Um, so I'm just going to put in a brief advertisement for a session at one o'clock this afternoon. We'll talk about this space here, uh, which is pictured as a Vicon uh, test facility, which does 3D motion capture. It's a large uh, facility that we use to collect the motion of, 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 of the human body as it undergoes different tasks. Um, and so I think I have a video that this is actually one of our alum um, uh, who is a professional women's, she's a, she's a biomedical engineer, but also a professional women's cyclist. Um, and we brought her into our lab and I, my video is not playing for some reason, but um, uh, there we go. But, uh, but anyway, so we're able to put her on the motion capture system. We'll talk a little bit about how this system actually works. The little green things that you see going by, that's actually her muscles firing as she's actually pedaling. So we can understand how she actually, uh, how she rides the bike and the relationship between her movement and muscle activity. So a little bit of advertisement for this afternoon. Um, with that, I think I'll wrap our session for now. Um, if any, anybody need, wants to stay on and ask some questions, and, spe and specifically if you want to talk to Gary, I would recommend that you uh, just throw your hand up and Todd can hopefully help us facilitate that or, um, or drop a question in the chat and we'll try and hit some of those. And, uh, and for the rest of you folks, we'll see you at one o'clock. Thanks. <laughs>